So hello everybody. Hi, I am Daksh Sisodia, student of IISC and a very good evening to all the budding artists present here with us today. I welcome you all today to this unique interactive session with none other than the great Nikhil Pradeep, a self-made artist who is here to share his wonderful and beautiful journey in the world of art. As we all know, Clabal Picasso rightly said, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. So today's workshop, known as Hatches and Hues, will help each one of you to find that hidden artist within you and learn how to nurture it well. So come with us on this breathtaking journey as we delve deep into the world of art, picking up new techniques, exploring unknown tips and tricks, busting myths and misconceptions, and learning how to avoid the most common mistakes. This priceless manifestation of knowledge shall be followed by a distinctive hands-on live session where Nikhil shall interact with all of you and guide you along. After that, you are requested to upload all of your sketches on the drive link that had been sent to you on mail. The best entry shall be put up on our social media handles for everyone to see. So stay tuned for a delightful voyage into the realm of artistic pleasure and enjoy with our quirky and brilliant instructor. Also, feel free to put up any and all questions or queries in the chat box, which shall later be put up to Nikhil by our moderators. To access the chat box, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Enjoy. Over to you, Nikhil. So welcome to the Hatches and Cues. So I'll be I'll be going through the entire presentation. So a little about me. I'm Nikhil Pradeep, third year at IISC. I was born in Kerala, but brought up in various parts of India, and I've stayed in Ahmedabad for majority of the time. I had no formal in no formal training in art, but I saw my mom drawing when I was really young, and which motivated me to start drawing. Even though she stopped drawing. I continued my passion with just a few household pencil and eraser and a printer paper. I started drawing cartoons which I used to watch. Even though I was not the best at what I was used to doing, but I was better than most of the students in my class. So that motivated me to push myself and to continue drawing. With just an HB pencil and a notebook which I bought six years ago, I started my journey of art and I discovered new techniques to improve my art as whole. Well. So there are a lot of myths involved in every theme, like be it science, be it art, be it music, and those myths actually stop us from getting further. So I'm here to debunk a lot of myths that are involved in arts, or as I like to put it, here are two facts about drawing. So the tip, the number one myth is not all can draw. Probably you have heard most of this a lot of time, but this is not true. Most of you have drawn something or the other at some point of your life. So, you know, it's obvious that it's a lie. Now, drawing doesn't have to be something that's perfect, that's breathtaking. Drawing is anything that you have put your imagination into, something that you have put your effort into and something that pleases you is considered as an art form. Now, another big myth is that all can draw. Now, hear me out. It's true to some extent that everybody can draw, but to the level of perfection that you want, you need three things. Practice, patience and persistence, without which you won't be able to move beyond the stage that you're present in. You don't necessarily have to put in all the hours at once. You can divide your time at equal intervals or whenever you are getting bored, but you should not. You should always have practice because practice helps you get around with the media that you are practice means that you are want to develop your skills on practice is necessary when you're trying out new media or want to perfect the old media and persistence is needed because you are going to make mistakes and if you don't if you're not willing to correct those mistakes you are bound to fail the third thing is talent is everything now that's a big overrated statement that you need to have talent to do well in art yeah, talent does give you some advantages, but that does not, you know, let you down. Anything that is given by talent can be achieved by practice. Now, art requires a lot of talent per se. Like it, you need to be able to visualize this shape. You need to be able to visualize the color. You need to be able to produce the, the shape and the color on the page. Now, a lot of us may not have the, oh, the all the talents, but all of you must have one or two talents. Some of you might have good eye to hand coordination. Some of you might be able to recognize color better. Some of you might be good at visualizing the art form first. 
all this can also be improved by training also by practice and you know you don't have to be born with a guitar to be starting to learn guitar the fourth myth is that you need to have the best and expensive great tools to be the best yeah it's true but not completely if you are a new beginner and you want to try new media if you buy the expensive media you will have a preconception that you know that whatever i produce using this media because it's expensive would be very good but that's a very bad and it's counterproductive because if you are new to a media you are bound to make mistakes even with expensive goods so my suggestion is you buy the cheapest good that is available in the market and practice that media until you have the best handle on that particular media the thing is when you have using cheap media you can't get the exact colors exact composition of what was in your mind so you will be forced to improvise and this improvisation helps you not only save money but also to get excellent in the art now another myth is you need to denote all your time for art that's not true at all you have life other than drawing unless you are you know aspiring to be a complete time artist or a career in art rest of you like me have a lot of busy schedules in between we find moments to draw in those times you can spend an hour a day or 30 minutes a day and just spend that time on art and if you spend i promise you 30 minutes a day you will see great improvements in the art and the more time you spend the more improvement you will see now another big misconception is a great artist produce great work all the time this is a big lie everyone makes mistakes some slightly more than other now great artists either learn how to hide their mistakes in plain sight or they just don't put out their mistakes out they just show you their best work and we are left with our oh, feeling wow he only produces great art now mistake helps us understand where we went wrong and making more discoveries like i will be demonstrating some of the mistakes i made and some of the things i discovered by making those mistakes so one good suggestion for you guys would be to make a notebook a note a drawing book small one large one anything that you are convenient and to try out the media of your preference on that drawing book so this drawing book can be your secret you can try on different media you can experiment with the current media on different scales before trying it out on the book that you are willing to show others this not only gives you confidence but also helps you discover the various things that you can achieve by the media and the biggest myth of all is i am too old to start art it's never too old to start drawing or any other hobby you just have to have the interest and have persistence to continue that drawing now there are a lot of people i know who have started drawing at a very young age and a lot of people who have not you know not that young and still have recently started and have achieved great height now the only difference the age makes is the time span that you have remaining for improving what you are currently doing so a young child would have his life span the old guy would have his life span that's the only thing that stopping no that's not stopping that's the only factor that is included when you are trying to add in the you know the age concept so it's not a excuse that you are too old to draw now like every great thing there are there are specific tools that are required for you know doing the trade and the same goes for art and as an artist i have used variety of tools particularly in pencil and i have recently started painting so yeah there too but yeah in pencil itself it's far beyond what you actually know so i'll share a few with you the first thing is the paper now the paper is a really tricky thing there are a lot of paper available on market for pencil drawing i would really suggest you buy some heavy papers that are you know having higher gsm so like the paper on the left the montemart paper is about 150 gsm which is really good for holding on the graphite to the paper this gives dark colors even more darker look as compared to normal printer paper 
Now, don't mistake it and buy the paper in the first place. You can start off with a normal printer paper that is found in most households and just experiment with those. Using printer paper would not only give you confidence, but also give you, you know, save money and help you explore more at a cheaper rate. Now, if you want to improve a bit out of the cheap print copier paper, you can buy the classmate notebook that is commercially available. It's slightly more thicker slightly less expensive and really good to try out. The classmate notebook was my first recorded book that I kept for drawing. I recently acquired the heavy GSM paper. And papers have variety of textures, variety of ways that it comes in. There are cold press, hot press. The papers basically differ in the grainy. The, in, if you smudge around the paper, you can see the grains forming and the ability to hold the graphite and water are you know usually with the heavy grade papers so experiment with different papers find the paper of your suitable and just go nuts another tool is the pencil now when i started drawing i just had an hb pencil that's the middle most you know value not dark not light it's the middle most and with that, just that hb pencil i practiced a lot it was not until left like two or three years ago i got to know that there were different pencils available in the market so i practiced my entire drawing you know experience with just the hb pencil and practiced until i could manipulate the hb pencil to the most dark i wanted and the most light i wanted so one good tip for you guys is to buy the entire set if you are able to and to practice, I wouldn't say you use the entire set, which would be good practice. But my suggestion is get the darkest pencil available in that set and then practice with it. The darkest pencil available would give the darkest tone on highest pressure. And as you relieve the pressure, that's the pressure you're holding on the pencil with, you can get the even the lightest value. So practicing with just one pencil will help you in the media a lot. The same goes for, you know, if you want to try out with the lightest pencil you can do, but my suggestion would be practice with just one pencil until you are very familiar with that media and you can manipulate it in any way you want, which will give you great exposure. And another thing for erasing the mistake are the eraser. Now the leftmost eraser is mostly found in our household. This is great for erasing pencil. This is found very cheap and you can use it very easily. But when you are developing a skill, you need to get more precise with the erasing. So for that, we can use a Combo Mono Zero Eraser that's shown in the middle. It's like a click pencil, but with the lid filled with eraser. Another tool that I commonly use is the moldable eraser, kneadable eraser. You can mold it into different shapes and lift the graphite layers very easily. Now, some people also use pencil eraser. I also use pencil eraser. It's a bit clumsy, but it does similar work. Now, for those who don't want to buy those expensive erasers, they are pretty expensive. You can just take a blade and cut the normal tool eraser into the shape that you want. This will help you get precise points of erasing if you are not willing to spend that money or if you are learning new techniques, which I, you know, I have used several times. And another thing is the blending or shading tool. Now, some artists prefer not to use those. They just use the hatching method for and the entire shading. But I use these methods for, you know, getting the hyper realistic textures of the skin. So one of the most used tool is the blending stump. These are like paper pencils, but without nib. The entire thing is made of paper. You can use it to carry the layer of graphite around and concentrate on small areas. Now, these are really as useful when you are drawing eye or any closed off surfaces as well as hair and the dark areas that are needed for shading. Now, another tool that I use is cotton and tissue paper. These are really useful while using, you know, spreading the graphite to a very large area such as skin, face, etc. You just have to spread a small amount of graphite and you can spread and make it even using cotton or the tissue paper. You can also use brushes while use, working with charcoal. 
and you obviously you would need sharpener for sharpening the pencil but i would not suggest you use sharpener for pencil that are of grade you know above 4b because the lead tends to be very brittle hence b and they tend to break very often when you sharpen so what i suggest you do is buy a blade and sharpen it smoothly with time now you need a lot of practice to use blade properly but once you have practice you will be able to get the lead out very easily without breaking the lead and another tool which i use for background is the graphite sticks these are completely made of graphite without any wood covering this can be sanded down using a sandpaper to get the graphite powder or you can directly use it on various pressures to get the background set and there are graphite powders available i haven't bought it yet because it's a bit expensive but they are available and artists use it all the time and i recently acquired charcoal pencils i was you know experimenting with different medias and i discovered charcoal pencils these are really good media if you want to get really dark values now you can't mix graphite and charcoal you can work with just charcoal or just graphite and you can mix if you want a particular kind of theme which i will be showing it was sort of a mistake but i knew what i wanted and another thing that is available are compressed char charcoal sticks they are basically like graphite stick completely made of charcoal they are really brittle and they spread a lot and they give such a darkness to the background that you know it just catches the eye and other essential tools that are used by artists are the fixative agents and the varnish the fixative agent is used because charcoal and pencil have a tendency to spread as soon as you put your hands on it or as soon as a surface comes in contact with it so it spread very easily especially the softer pencils like the 8b 7b and 6b this very easily smudge and destroy the painting or the drawing and charcoal does it anyway if be the hard or the soft charcoal so what artists do is they spread the fixative around these locks the graphite or the charcoal layers in place and so it prevents it from spreading now that's the end of the entire tools that are used for pencil drawing now i would take some questions which any of you might have yeah so we have few questions here um the first question being uh, participants wanted to know what are what is gsm yeah gsm is gram per square meter it's basically how heavy the paper would be the thicker the paper the higher the gsm would be okay uh, then the second question is um, are needable erasers too costly yeah, needable erasers are pretty cheap they are about like they are costlier than the normal eraser but they come around 50 rupees 50 indian rupees yeah okay and uh, the last question for this particular session uh, is uh, how do you decide if one should use charcoal or graphite yeah so the thing is it's according to you the effect that you want to acquire with graphite and charcoal are very different the charcoal gives really dense dark values that if you want to want for the background to be very dark or the entire drawing to stand out you can use charcoal for that it's perfectly fine but the fault about charcoal is it spreads a lot so i generally don't use charcoal for my drawings because it's really hard to control after one point and graphite can be used as it's smoother it can give you pretty much almost all the values but if you are look if you take photos or you look through a particular area the graphite will shine especially the softer graphite so it can pose its own problem it does not spread as much as charcoal my preference is still graphite because i'm still learning to use charcoal better um there is one more question we have yeah. um so how do we know our style uh, someone's asking about that like how do they decide their style so uh, the i think you mentioned about style yeah so the best way to know your style is to try out that media if like i was very skeptical about watercolors because they were hard to manage and i was a bit impatient so you know the watercolor needs some time to dry to get the layers doing which i was very skeptical about because 
my childhood memories were I spoiled all the watercolors that I did. So I recently started watercolors again and found out they are quite interesting. I won't say that everybody will get the style on spot. Everybody has a different style. You just have to experiment with one particular media at a time or try mixed media if that suits you and just keep on trying until you hit that comfort level that you feel. If that comforts you, that's your style. So that's it. Okay, thank you. You can proceed. Yeah. So as I told, I just told, I just recently started watercolors and it's really quite fun media. It's a bit hard to control than pencil and you need to have a lot of patience to try. I'll show you some of the watercolor tools I generally use for those who are interested in watercoloring. So again, paper. But for watercolor, I would not suggest you use the printer paper because printer paper is generally around 80 GSM and they usually fold very easily as soon as you hit with water. So the thing about watercolor is that you need to have ample amount of water to spread the paint around and the paint goes as much as there is water. And the paint is restricted to areas of water, so it can be easily used for manipulating in that area. And so there are a lot of costs. The papers are generally cost here. You can use 150 GSM, which I've been using. It works quite well. It holds enough water and does not crumble easily. You can also use the classmate notebook if you are using limited amount of water. Don't use printer paper because it will crumble for the entire paint. It has the least amount of ability to hold water. Now, for those who are going into hardcore watercolor, those who know that it's their media of choice, you can go, you can offer higher GSM paper like RPs. They are really good. They are a bit on the costly side, not a bit, a lot on the costly side. But once you are familiarized with the media, I'm yeah, expressing that like deeply. Once you are very familiarized with that media, you can move to the expensive brand and try it out because if you are using expensive brand, you know, you have a bit of discomfort using it. Try down, you know, cheaper papers and then move to it. And also, once you buy the expensive papers, don't store it for later use. Just use it. If you store it for later use, it would just sit there collector. So just if you have, if you have bought the expensive brand, just go and practice on it. Until then, buy the cheaper one and practice until you are, you know, fairly confident of it. And another comes is the paint. Now, watercolor paints are commercially available in two forms. One is the cakes that's seen on the left, and the other is the cubes. Now, these paints are quite, we can't say cheap, but you know, can be easily affordable. And this paint is really, you know, you just have to put a little bit of water and spreads like easily. Now they both have its own advantage and disadvantage. The advantage of the cake is that you know exactly how much of paint that you want and if you want extra you just it with water and just take it out. As compared to cube, if you squeeze out the paint it's on the palette. You can't unsqueeze it. As compared to cake, if you wet a paint you take as much as you want and you leave the remaining there. Now, the advantage with cubes is that you can cover large areas with tubes and get a very good gradient with just one color. You can do monochrome with tubes far better than one with the cake. And obviously, you would need brushes to paint. I would prefer nylon brushes for watercolor painting because it holds water as well as paint very easily. You need water for watercolor painting because water helps to move the paint around. So nylon brushes are good. There are a variety of brushes available. I use flat brush for covering large areas. I use round tape for focus painting. And there are another brushes called water brushes available. Water, water paint brushes or water brushes. These brushes are made of synthetic fiber and they can hold water inside. So instead of keeping on dipping the brush in water, you just have to squeeze the brushes and the water will come out of the tip, which helps in easy manipulation of watercolors. I use the second latter one 
quite recently and I found it amazing. Now, like as I told, I just started watercolor, so I made a lot of mistakes too. I'll be sharing those with you for those who are interested in watercolors. But I have been very new to those media, so I don't know how much I can help you in that media. But I can help you in the pencil shading. I have been doing that for quite a long time. And I'll show you some of my drawings that I made. So these are some of the examples of the pencil shaded things I made. I first started with object drawings, then I moved on to drawing portraits from pictures, Pinterest. Yeah, guys subscribe to Pinterest, they give you a lot of ideas on portrait, photography or drawings and you can get the ideas easily from there, you know, for free. And I get the drawing done, I get the background done. It takes each drawing takes about six to ten hours. Not continuously, I divide it for weeks to come. And yeah, I yeah, this is the shine I was talking about with graphite. Now this drawing, if you see from face up, it's completely dark, but when light falls on graphite, it tends to shine. So this shine usually ruins the drawing because while taking photograph, it stays there. But in photograph, it gets ruined and it's really hard to take photograph of graphite drawing. So char hence charcoal can be used. Charcoal doesn't give the shine. It just absorbs light. And another very good drawing according to me is this drawing. I spend a lot of hours on detailing to the small extent. This is from a movie called So I used to watch. Yeah, this one is really recent. And yeah, so that's my drawing with pencil. Now, another thing I would like to discuss, I would discuss in mistakes, but yeah, I'll come back to it. So I recently started with watercolors. And with watercolors, I did a few experiments like this. So yeah, I'll take you through how to watercolor too. So this can be e these kind of things can be easily achieved by watercolors and they give a good effect. And also, I, as I told, you need to experiment di with different media of your liking. I did a lot of experimenting. I tried pencil colors. I tried cartoon making. I tried crayons. I did try with pencil too. So you know once you get once you try and get familiarized with a particular media of your liking you can excel in that particular media now i'm currently working on how to improve my watercolor skills and my mistakes as i told i will come back to it so first let us talk about some of the mistakes in my presented drawing now this drawing might not look to have any mistakes but the thing is the face looks flat there are no drastic lights that are falling on the face. There are no shadows forming that are, you know, that gives the face a good value. So it looks a bit 2D than the 3D which I wanted to get. See this drawing, there are shadows forming on one side of the face than the other. This gives a bit of a 3D effect which is absent in this drawing. Even this has a bit of shadow. Like, see, the entire left side of the face is having a shadow effect. So it gives an in a depth to the face rather than making it flat. Also one problem is the patience. Now this cherry was the first cherry I drew which stood out very good. But then as you move along you can see that I lost my patience and the cherries here and here look a bit flat than this. So have patience too. And another thing is consistent with stroke. You can see the strokes that are present here with my pencil. It's not dark enough, you know, to hide those. So that's one common mistake that, you know, people make, even I make. So yeah. And I re as I told, I recently started watercoloring. So there are more mistakes in that area than the recorded ones. But one very famous mistake in graphite is graphite and charcoal as you can see I did the entire drawing of the body and hair with graphite but I spoiled the entire drawing by making the background with charcoal 
Now the thing about charcoal is it doesn't shine. It's giving consistent black, but the drawing is popping out. It's like I place a sticker on a black paper. It's not blending into the darkness as you've seen earlier drawings. So that's the problem. The graphite and charcoal does not make the two layers stand out unless you want that effect into your drawing. Like if you want to give an effect of black paper and the pa and the drawing just standing out, you can go ahead with this. It's really good way. I spent a lot of hours in detailing this drawing before experimenting with charcoal and graphite. So I am a little bit sad that I spoiled the drawing, but you know, I learned from a mistake. Now, as I told, I recently started water cutting and I made a lot of mistakes. One of the mistake is that I let the paint dry before I added these layers. So they stand out rather than blending in like this did. So it's a really screwed up mistake. Now, this was one of my first watercolor experiments. I started off with the cakes, watercolor cakes. I did layer the paint ran out. I added more water. So this layer became lighter than this. So it began it became a really inconsistent artwork. Same with this, the pink color is not consistent. So there are a lot of spots remaining. And same, the thing about this drawing is I didn't let the layers dry. As you can see, it's not prominent, but you can see in this area, the paint was not dry. So this area's paint and the area bled into each other. So there is a process known as bleeding, which occurs in watercolors that what happens is that if two layers are in contact with each other and these two layers are not dry they bound to get into each other you will see a big prominent example later and you can also see that the green color has also bled into the skin of the top again these layers were wet i tried and this layer dried up before i added the paint so this layer did not bled see that's the problem earlier it bled this time when i wanted it to bleed it did not it just stayed there and i added more water which did not do any good other than spread out these pen markings and this one also it's not visible but those who know the anime weathering with you the character is pretty light skin but i didn't know how much paint to take so i just added it in the paint with made her look tanned and yeah this is a big example of bleeding so what i did was i did the background first light blue and then i made the veil and painted it dark blue if you i don't know if it's visible or not but there is a slight pencil line drawn here that's how thick the veil it was supposed to be but the veil just expanded as soon as it hit the layer and the veil grew from this size to this size, which made the drawing look not like a veil. So yeah, those are some of the mistakes I made during the learning curve. And I'm still making mistakes and I'm still learning from those mistakes. Now I'll let you into some of the processes in drawing. I'll show you a video of me drawing and painting. So that should be great help. So let's start with the painting demo. It's a small one. It took quite less time. So what I start off is by drawing a rough outline of the thing I wanted to draw. So what I was drawing was a feather, which you have seen earlier. And once I drew, I add a layer of water to the entire feather. I don't add water to ex the outside. I just, you know, stop the water inside the feather itself. I include the water inside the feather itself. So once that's done, I add play paint on top of water. Now the beauty of watercolor is that the paint does not go beyond the presence of water. The paint does not go to the dry areas of the paper. So it's easy to manipulate in that way. So I spread the first layer that light blue on the paper and before the paper was dried, I added the dark blue on top and I let the effect of bleeding take over. So what happens is the dark blue and the light blue, since these two layers are wet, they bleed into each other. 
and the same goes for the black i did not make these grasses they just happened because the black is more prominent than the light blue so when the black spread from the area where it's applied to the wet area it just spread and caused the grass like effect and i am applying darker areas and i'm just letting the bleeding process to set in now i add a few more layers now these lines that you see are pretty straight but the bleeding will take over and make it more diffuse so once the paper is dry you can see what happens so once the paper is dry the those prominent lines that were present just spread out so i darken it again i add a few more details i darken the edges i add a few layers and i let the paint dry again and once it's completely dry i add in the fine details i add in the deer and that's it that's the entire painting so that's the entire painting in hand i use a jelly roll pen to get the stars and the shooting star and the moon in orbit now another recent drawing that i made on camera was that of the sherlock it mess is the you know the background was a bit rushed so it left the you know what you saw what i pointed out a lot of stroke pattern visible so i'll show you how i did the sherlock drawing so i started off by making the you know rough outline first i yeah that's another tip guys don't start off by drawing as dark as possible draw as light as possible because when you are drawing for the first time anything like be it you have drawn a figure hundreds of times while drawing it again on a paper on a fresh sheet of paper you are bound to make a few mistakes or a few areas that you don't like so what you do is you should not put all the pressure into the paper you should apply as light as possible so that you can see the stroke lines that you draw the outline but not too deep too dark that you can't erase it off if you made mistake so first of i started off drawing very lightly and i increased darkness once i was comfortable with the piece that i drew there's lot of erasing going on yeah so once i was comfortable i i darkened the lines so i can easily visualize it so this is one way to sharpen the pencil especially the darker pencil you can you know use a blade and slowly sharpen it until you get the size that you want now you have to be really careful not to overdo it or the lead will break so what i what i start off is i layer a small area of graphite base so i layer a small area of graphite by slanting the pencil like this and i spread the graphite around so this gives a uniform layer of graphite as long as you are keeping a consistent pressure so once i did i use a blending stem to darken out areas that i want dark and i use a tissue paper to smoothen it out as you can see now i add i prefer to draw a paint drawing layer by layer so first i add the lightest layer of graphite then i use more graphite to areas which are more darker then i do the closed off areas the eyes the nose and the mouth are the closed off areas you can completely shade them and move on because you know that doesn't affect the outside areas like the nose still would be dark so you can go in and directly shade it dark instead of waiting it to come up now the drawing is looking flat because i haven't added the layer completely so i shade yeah the eyes the nostrils and the lips and yeah i add more layers of graphite i blend it blend it in the process goes on for some time the entire drawing took me 8 hours to complete so yeah so the face is now coming to look a bit three dimensional right see getting a three dimensional drawing is not about accuracy it's about light and shadows if you can work with the light and shadows you can get the figure the depth that is needed and it would look the blank drawing that was started off so as 
if you remember the drawing was pretty flat but once i added the shadows that are formed on the face it started popping out it started to get that you know feel of a face so yeah dark a dark and the eyebrows the area under the eye because those are prominent shadow areas this is benedict cumberbatch and he has a pretty sharp cheekbone so it will cast a good shadow on his cheeks so i go over the hands the face again and again see that's why you need persistence you need to and patience you need to make mistakes you need to recognize them you need to erase them and work on them again and you need to have patience because you are doing it layer by layer the entire layering took me a long time so yeah so again i add a few more layers i add in few more detail in the hands the face etc and i make some marking for the hair now this does not look anything like hair this will come later adding a few more details and yeah if you guys want to save time you can you know either listen to some music or as i was doing i was watching a movie in the side you can do that to you know maximize your time utilize some artists say that you need to focus on your art itself but you know i tend to not focus on the movie itself i just like to hear the sound while working so works for me yeah so i use the darkest pencil available that's a 10b in my hand and i go around doing this motion for the entire background so doing this was the most cumbersome because you know it takes a lot of time so i go on doing this for the entire background i'll speed up so yeah yeah and one more thing you need to know that i am using a tissue paper below my palm why i am using this is because graphite especially the softer graphite have a good tendency to spread around and if you use your palm the palm has a lot of oils that accumulate here and sweat and oil generally helps the graphite to stick to your palms more and this graphite can ruin your drawing i learned it the hard way so use a tissue paper use a pencil shade around and then lift your hand lift the tissue paper place it and shade don't spread it and don't do it without tissue paper or butter paper now for hair i like for the entire background and the hair i just shaded the entire thing black but if i shade the entire thing black the drawing would look a bit off so what i did i was the hair has a tendency to shine so as soon as light hits on the hair it will shine so what i did was i left some squares triangles and some different shapes in place these i will work on later to give an effect of hair the thing of art is to give the illusion of hair you are working on a 2d paper till you are getting a 3d image how you are you know you are tricking the brain to assume you know you're tricking the audience you're tricking the people who are seeing to get a 3d shape you are just getting shadows in one area or you are putting light on another to get the 3d image that's all what you need so i went on doing the background for some time So yeah the hair is still not looking like hair the thing you can do is what i do is i draw random lines over the hair it still doesn't look a, much like hair but it does give the illusion and blend it out like get a darkest pencil and blend it out now it looks like the clump of hair that's coming out of his curl and that's what i want the effect of hair so i smudge around i get this area bit even a few more final detailing and the drawing is over 
and the yeah bit dramatic I think. so yeah here's the drawing and this is the shine i was talking about again on graphite the sunlight was falling directly on the paper and to the camera so it produced that shine so yeah let's draw together and before that i would take some questions if anybody has some yeah so we have a few questions uh, so siddharth has asked us uh, what pencil would you recommend to get started with yeah so for starting with you can buy the camlin pencil which i have here you can manipulate just the 10b or the 8b to get all the shades if you want that but this is pretty cheap you can just use a copier paper and just start off okay um the next part uh, the next question is um so in st uh, like the person previously had asked about style right so they have mentioned that the style in pencil sketching like smooth uh, smooth shading or hatching yeah so that too like some artists prefer hatching i will present to you what hatching what smooth shading etc some artists prefer the hatching method because that gives a artistic touch than the realistic touch like it all depends on you how you like to present the particular art it has no constraints nobody will say that uh, the realistic shading is looking good or the hatching is looking good i have known artists who do beautiful hatching work i know artists who do beautiful shading work it all depends on what you want to present now there are artists who present extremely three dimensional pictures and then there are artists who produce paintings like screen they are extremely two dimensional made of paint some people don't like it but the artist wanted to present it in that particular way in that particular style so there is no restraint on them you just have to pick a style you can even mix them you can do partially hatching partially you know getting the smooth areas which i'm going to demonstrate in a short while and you know you can just get it done it all depends on you um the next question is how does one choose between cakes and tubes yeah again it's your preference as i told cakes and cakes and tubes have its own advantages and disadvantages if you want to save money go for cake because what happens with tubes is you squeeze too much the paint comes too much out and you know it goes to waste if you are unable to use up all the paint or you can refrigerate it i don't know if it works but i use cake because you know it gives the paint in hand and you can use as much paint as you want but consistency can get a bit hard if you are new to it but you know no paint is wasted okay um the next question is what is blending yeah blending is a process of you know not showing the strokes that you are doing so if you know i'll show you what blending properly okay um the next question is how do we get the right gradients with paints with paints the, with watercolors what you can do is wait i'll show you I actually forgot thanks for reminding so with watercolors what you can do is make something called swatch uh, shade swatches this gives you the entire scheme of the paint that you have in hand so what you have to do is take a dry paper dip one end of the paint brush in the paint and spread until it runs out of paint so for example i did with black you get the darkest values with black using this and with as much as you dilute it you can get till this area so by making this you can get pretty good idea that this is the darkest i can go this is the lightest using the paint i can go so you can easily compare with the reference drawing and how much dark you want you can also do it layer by layer like you paint a layer it will dry it might become a lighter you just have to paint it over again and it will give darker tones you know consistently um okay the next question is uh, how does one paint fine lines painting fine lines is a bit tricky i generally use either very fine tip brushes fine tip round brushes are available or if you want to make lines you can easily use it using a ballpoint pen the the good thing about ballpoint pen is it is having a very small tip and the ink does not spread in presence of water 
so what i generally do is for all of my paintings is i draw the outline using a ballpoint pen that's it that gives the effect of outline does not spread and does the work done so the next question is um, do you make a light outline before painting or do you directly paint yeah i i always make light outline before painting because i'm not that much confident in painting that's the first point and second using a light outline gives you restraint it gives you constraint and the pencil can be erased paint can't be so if i make a mistake in proportion or if i make a mistake in some areas which i decide later i don't want i can easily erase but if i start off with paint all of a sudden it i can't do anything about it other than start fresh also one suggestion for you guys if you want to make the paint look like you didn't draw any outline use color pencils now what you have to do is whatever color you are like if you are drawing a red apple you use the red color pencil to draw the outline so when the paint sets in the color of the outline gets inside in get you know undistinguishable with the paint and it gives an effect of done without outline or you can use extremely light pencils like hard pencils even with hb you can get really soft like very soft lines okay uh, so the next question is uh, what is bleeding yeah so as i explained earlier bleeding is a process that occurs in watercolor in this mistake that i made what i did was i added the layer of light blue in the background and this is the end of the veil okay this is the surface or the terminal of the veil and i i added the sur- the sky blue or the ocean color till here and i added the dark blue till this line so what happened was these two layers came in contact with each other and the water as water has a cohesion and adhesion it easily mixes with each other so with water goes the paint so the paint from this layer bled into this layer it basically goes into the opposite layer which we don't want unless that's the effect that you're going for so bleeding is basically mixing of two adjacent water colors okay uh, the next question is by palika uh, she wants to know how to ensure that layer uh, that layering takes place smoothly with no clear boundaries yeah for layering without boundaries what you have to do is first start off with a simple motion like you know while using a pencil i'll demonstrate in a short while i go around in a parallel line fashion and i generally don't tend to increase the pressure or increase the tilt i maintain it consistent but even then there are stroke values visible which can be easily smoothed out using a cotton or a tissue paper so by doing that you can hide your stroke values easily and there is another method in which you can just go and twirl around i'll show you that too which covers really slowly like it painfully slow but it does give a consistent value without giving any stroke you know visible okay uh, the next question is from bhumi she uh, says that she thinks uh, like you know about this channel called drawholic uh, and then she is asking you uh, if you could tell her about the way to start the drawing method i really have no idea what drawholic is and okay. i didn't get the second question basically she wants you to tell how to start the way of drawing like the method the first method of drawing is visualization you first make you know get an idea of what you want to draw if you if you are determined to draw a ball let's say you have to stick and get the ball in hand or get the reference of the ball always start off with the reference if you are starting off drawing for the first time don't try to draw from imagination as you know you are not familiar with the entire concept if you are familiar with a particular concept then you go ahead but i always use reference and you know you just have to be patient in visualization 
and getting the outline into the paper. That's the first and the foremost step. Later comes the shading, which I will be demonstrating. I will also help you visualize stuff too. The visualizing okay. and getting it on the paper is the primary and the most important step. Okay, uh, so we have another question from Mihir. Can oil color be used instead of watercolors for better drawing? Yeah, it all depends on you. I haven't used oil colors because they are a bit costlier on the side and you know, I'm still learning how to use the brush properly. Oil colors are a different media than watercolors. It does not bleed. It does not mix well too. Like if you want to get the effect that is present using watercolors, you can't get it by using oil colors. Now oil colors has its own shine, its own properties and you know, oil, water, the problem with watercolor is it's hard to layer. Like if you have a dark, if you paint black, you can't paint white petals using watercolors. As, as soon as you put water on top of the black paint, it will get activated again. This can be easily achieved by oil colors. You can add layers. You can add different layers on top of those oil colors. So yeah, you can, but I don't know surely how to use oil colors. Okay. Uh, the next question is, is it good to use reference to draw or should one execute their own idea? Yeah, the thing is you need like for getting your own idea. Let's say I'm very familiar with drawing faces. That's because I have seen a lot of faces. That's because I have you know, drawn a lot of faces. I know the proportions. That's only because I have used references in my past. So I know where the eyes should be. I know where the nose should be. Without using a reference, I don't think you can learn anything suddenly. You can either use, you know, live reference such as nature or any tools that are lying around, or you can use pictures. Like as I told, Pinterest would be a great tool for getting a lot of, you know, reference images that you want. I use Pinterest a lot. And, you know, it, it's never restricting to use a reference for drawing. Every great artist has used a reference for drawing. If you want to draw some imagination, go ahead with it. It does not stop you. It does not make your drawing look bad, but you have to make sure that you have an idea and think about what you want to draw because without it, the drawing won't be as good as you expected it to be in your head. Like for drawing faces, if I started off drawing face without ever having looked at the reference just by knowing, yeah, there are eyes, nose and mouth present, I won't get the proportions correct. My eyes can be lopsided, my nose can be tilted, my lips can be too wide or too short or to the side, my nose can go to my forehead. Like the proportion gets screwed up. So I always prefer you start off with the reference and then move on to the, you know, with your imagination. Yeah, that's the last question we had. Uh, you can continue. Thank you. So now first I'm going to show you a few things. I want you to get your paper and pencil ready. Now you guys are going to follow along with me in. I'll teach you how to draw faces according to proportions. I'll teach you how to shade properly. I'll teach you how to, you know, shade using different styles and strokes and I'll teach you how to shade a complex figure. I want you guys to follow along with me and draw at least one of which I'm showing and then give it to the, you know, the Google files that have been sent to you. Just follow along and don't worry if you mess it up. I have messed up a lot of times. I have made a lot of mistakes. I have been practicing for like two days continuously for this presentation. So. Yeah, even if I might also screw up, I don't know. I have to give it a try, but hopefully I won't and you guys will learn something new. So first off, I'll start by teaching you how to shade. Now there are a variety of methods of shading. The most prominent one is called a hatching in which you go. Yeah, I'm using a charcoal pencil medium then because it's quite dark and easy to visualize than graphite for the particular show. So yeah. Hatching is a method in which you draw consecutive parallel or cross lines to give the dark to light value. So what you can do is, you know, for practicing, always draw this for practice. These are called grades. 
for getting the shades done so for the first one if you go with me minimum pressure you can get a really light value if you increase the pressure slightly you can get a darker value you move these lines closer you will get even more darker value like very close you get a lot more darker value and finally you do do the same step as earlier but add in another layer by crossing so by this method you can get the entire gradient from light to dark very easily and this method is commonly known as hatching method which somebody had asked and by this method you can get variety of styles i have used hatching method in my old drawing this is really easy you don't have to use any other tool other than your pencil you don't have to buy those blending stumps and even tissue paper you don't need just you can spread around and do the entire drawing using just this hatching method or you can even mix media and you know use hatching and the shaded one it's all up to you it's all your style now another method i generally use especially for larger areas is holding the pencil like this and using my entire you know arm to get a shade right i spread the graphite around keeping the angle constant and the pressure constant and if you are like used to it you can get pretty you know equal gradient and a good practice technique for the you can use the same method in here also you just have to you know draw the box get the lightest shade over here with the minimum pressure and increase the pressure slightly as you go ahead so you get a pretty consistent shade throughout if you maintain the pressure but if you like go ahead and do like this increase pressure and then decrease pressure it creates a odd area out which you don't need so for this method you need to have a bit pay more patience and it covers a large area but you know you need to be consistent with the pressure or else you will end up spoiling the entire drawing because you will be left with these patches now another thing about this method is that let's say you are shading a sphere you first layer the first base shade now this is not me really shading anything the shading will come later i'm just showing you you can see the stroke patterns that are visible so for that you can just use a tissue paper and just smoothen those stroke pattern out this is known as blending to some extent yeah this is blending this is the smoothing out is known as blending so the lines that were present here is smoothed out you can add another layer of dark over here and just blend it out so what blending does is it's basically like bleeding there are two layers that are present one is one layer one and second is layer two blending actually mixes these layer at the boundary as well as the sides making them uniform and a gradient crossing over and the method i use for getting small areas done properly is a bit like going like this or going like this but on a very small scale it takes a bit more time so if you go around keeping the pressure constant you can shade the entire area black it takes a long time so i'm just stopping it here 
but it does not leave any stroke patterns visible and does not need any tissue paper or blending tool to blend the shaded area so it gets the work done very easily so are you guys okay so far are you following or uh, are there any doubts Rashi, please do tell me if somebody posted some doubt. Yes, so there is uh, there is a question. Where do the darker shade like shadow effects go? Yeah, that I will explain to you while I'm shading. As I told the sphere, I'm just using to show. You know, I'm just using a closed surface to just show you the shading. I'll be shading an object soon. I'll tell all about the light and shadows there. OK, and then uh, Rudranch has asked a question. Is there any unique style to hold a shading pencil? The thing is some artists have their own preference. When I am shading large areas, I want to maintain the pressure constant. My pencil tips are usually sharp, so if I'm shading a large area using this, it takes a long time and leaves these awkward stroke patterns visible. So what I do for shading large areas is I hold the pencil like this with thumb and spread using the sides. So what this does is get the uniform layer done and very quickly without leaving much, you know, the stroke patterns visible. And while covering the small areas, I flip my pencil and then shade the areas. So it does the small areas one very accurately and very, you know, by using this, you can't enclose the entire shade in a square. It is bound to get out at certain points. But by flipping the pencil and holding the pencil like this, you can concentrate your tip on particular areas and you know, get the area done according to your wish without going out. OK, uh, there is another question. Uh, da Vinci used a method called, I think it's pronounced as fumato in painting. Could we do the same in sketching? I have no idea what, what fumato is. Can, can he or she explain like what he meant? OK, we'll wait for their response. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's it for now. So now let's move on to a drawing technique called Loomis method. Now the Loomis method is a phase drawing method, which was which can be used very easily for drawing. As I told, drawing means getting a picture into the paper. And the first step is drawing that picture as it is on that paper. You need to get the proportion right. You need to get the you know, shapes and figures correct. So a very famous method for drawing head is the Loomis method. I'll be demonstrating how a Loomis method works. So if I'm taking this clay as a model of head, the he not head per se, it's the cranial mass, the, the skull, not skull, the upper part of the skull. So we can represent it by a circle, but the thing about skull is it's not completely a sphere. It's a compressed sphere with sides cut off like this. You can see the sides are cut off. And you can draw the lines like a plus on both sides and connect the lines between. Now this gives a proportion correct and also helps you draw head in any position. Like if the person is facing side, this is what you see the outer circle, the inner circle and the line along with the eye position and stuff. If a person is looking straight, this is what you see. The you don't see the entire the side, but you can see the head, the line, the midline, etc. And the most famous position is the three by four position. That's three quarter position. So the head is tilted a bit like this. So So you can see the line is getting cut off from one area. There is the midline, there is this, you know, the eyebrow line, etc. 
Now, representing this on a paper can be considered a bit tricky, but it's easier than it looks. So, if I'm drawing a face, it consists of two parts. One, yeah, so for drawing circle, I draw first very lightly. Yeah, the face consists of, I'm drawing a bit three by four view. So the outer circle is the one that is shown here. The inner circle in which the grid, the lines are this area, which is, you know, basically cut off of a sphere. And, you know, again, and the area of the jaw. So if you combine these two together, you get a face. That's it. That's the entire method of Loomis or the Loomis method. So what you can do is, let's say we are drawing a three quarter view. That's the one I have shown here. You can start off by drawing a sphere. There are a lot of ways of drawing sphere. Please don't use compass. Like that really stops your skills. And you draw the inner circle. And you draw, like if the person is looking straight, yeah. So let me explain this. Yeah, so the line you see here is the line that is considered from the here, here to the eyebrows. So if I'm looking straight, it is a straight line. If I'm looking down, the line goes down. If I'm looking up, the line points up. So the line that is representing here represents the way the person is looking. So if the person is looking up, this line will go up because the eyebrows are going up. The person is looking down from the ear to eyebrow, it goes down. And if the person is looking straight, it remains straight. So let's say the person is looking straight for now. So I draw this line parallel and then this. So this gives the location of eyebrows. The second line is this, which gives the position of the hairline where the hair starts. You know. And this, the line drawn from the bottom gives the nose line. So hair, eyebrows and nose, this helps you get in proportion and the area that is here and here are roughly the same for an average person. It can differ from person to person. Some people have, you know, receding hairline, so this area would be larger. Some some people have smaller nose or the nose closer to the face, so you can decrease the line to here. Yeah, it differs from people to people. You can adopt this from average to the person that is needed. But generally speaking, it looks a bit like this. Yeah. So now for drawing the jaw, that this box over here, you just have to take this measurement once more. Generally speaking for an average person, this, this, a, this side, this side and the jaw side are roughly the same. So the jaw would come about somewhere here. You just have to join this, the line that I forgot to draw, this and this. So if I'm, I were to darken the areas that are relevant, so that's the entire Loomis head. Now you have to draw the center line through which the tip of the nose passes and the mouth you can position rest of the anatomical features over there and you can draw the lines that represent the jaw and stuff. So once it's done and I'm just shading a bit so prominent. So yeah, that's the entire way to get the head proportion correct. This is not a method to get the eyes and nose position. There are, there is a method called Riley method, which I won't be showing it's a bit time consuming and technical, but yeah, this is a way you can get the proportions of the head correct. 
Now you can adopt the Loomis head Loomis head method for drawing various, you know, ways in which the person is looking. So if the person is looking in the straight way, you can see the cut that is present. The circle would be straight, and you can see the cut portion. So you just have to draw a straight line. Again, divide into three hair line. The middle one is the eyebrows and the nose. Extend this once more and join. So yeah, the nose comes here, the eyebrows comes about here, and you can easily manipulate the remaining areas using this method. And this looks a bit off. Yeah. And you can also draw from the side view. From the side view, you can on you can see the larger circle and the smaller circle. So drawing the side view. And the smaller circle will be a complete it's oval here, obviously because you are not seeing the complete circle. But in this, the side view, the circle, the oval would actually be a complete circle that's in the perfect middle because you know you are viewing the side. Now, draw a straight line. If the person is viewing straight, nose, hair. Now, if you want to work. Let's say you want to draw complete the piece. Yeah, you can just gently go over. Yeah. So if you want to add details, you can easily add a bit. Now, another interesting proportion about face is. The distance between here to here is equal to here to the center. So, you know, here to here, that's this distance, and this that should give the tip of the nose. So, the tip of the nose should come around this line. So, you just have to add in those details. So see, by using the Loomis method, you are actually getting the shape of the head. Let them drawing a word. This one is easier to recognize. So, yeah. so as you can see, by using it's looking crooked in the video. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, it's more. Or less, yeah. So. By using Loomis method, you actually got the proportions of the face correct. And by using this method, you can draw any face in any position you want. You just have to take if somebody has elongated head, you just have to extend this line to top and go accordingly. Or if somebody has an extended jaw line, if somebody has you know, protruding cheekbones, you just have to add on the normal Loomis head, and that will work. If somebody has a cheekbone, let's say. You just have to add this on here. That will get you the work done. So yeah, any questions in the Loomis method? So we have a few questions. Uh, so one of the questions is which graphite pencil I must use to get similar consistency as the charcoal pencil so is using like it has been addressed to you. Uh, no, no, That's like I'm I prefer you know light you know you can use light pencils you don't have to be exactly the same as me i'm using charcoal because you know i'm showing you guys with the paper to the camera and if i use lighter pencil it won't be visible at all the graphite would give the shine of the light bulb that's above you can see the shine already over here it's granite yeah so the graphite would give the shine during the shading session which i don't want you can use any pencil that you want, preferably a light pencil for getting the outlines. This is these are outline methods. So you need to use light pencil as you can see the I don't need the circle 
the complete circle right now. I don't need these circles, the lines. I don't need. I just need the outline and the positions of the relative face parts. As you can see, there is a lot of things that I don't need in this picture itself. So what I do is I draw the lightest outline possible. I have drawn darker because you guys need to see it and then proceed to filling in with the details. So my suggestion to you guys just go easy with the lightest pencil in hand and just go ahead and draw it. OK, uh, the next question is from Kanat. Uh, so he had mentioned about Da Vinci's method right for Mato. Yeah. Yeah. So he said that it means blending the outline of the drawing to make it look realistic. He's asking if we can implement such a thing in sketching. Yes, yes, obviously like. That's one more thing I forgot to mention. Thanks for asking. The thing is that real life images don't have boundaries. Like if I'm drawing a book, I like see, it does not look like an actual book. It looks like a cartoon because there are boundaries present here, which in original drawing original things we don't see. There are no boundaries present in real life. So what we can give is the effect of a boundary. So instead of drawing boundary, if I just. You know, get the rest of the area stand out. You can get the effect of boundary and then just shade in accordingly. You can get the effect of the three dimension without leaving any boundary lines. So yeah, it's really good. You should not leave any boundaries. Wait, I'll show you. In this drawing, I did not draw any boundaries intentionally. I just left it out. So this area looks like, you know, it's the light is falling here. So the background to this ratio, the background is a bit darker. Here it gets lighter and the skin is a bit darker than the background. You can see I did not use any boundaries to draw any lines over here. I just left it out and the shades get the difference between the head starting of the head and the boundaries. Same goes for here. You can see I did not draw any lines to separate the body and the thing. I just use the shapes and the shadows to give a representation of the boundary. So this actually is a good tip. This gives a realistic touch than leaving a boundary at every site to make the drawing pop out. If you the in real life, nothing pops out unless it's fluorescent colors in black and white. Nothing pops out of the picture unless it's very contrasting. So if you draw lines to indicate the boundaries, the things don't exist that way. So yeah, you can just use the shading to get the, you know, get the image to stand out. OK, um, so the next question is from Palika. Uh, is it necessary to make the circles and lines using freehand? Can I use compass and rulers? I won't suggest you using compass and rulers because, you know, you are learning to you hold the pencil probably you are learning to you know visualize and put that drawing into the paper. So if you are already using tools such as compass, you are restricting yourself from learning how to draw without those tools because the end goal is to be independent and just use your pencil and the paper to complete a drawing. So just practice drawing circles, practice drawing lines. It doesn't have to be perfect the first time you try. You just practice until you can draw a circle without using compass. Practice drawing lines, practice going like this. Draw lines, straight lines. Don't don't do this. Give a confident stroke. That's it. So that gives the line and for circle you can do either what some artists do, do is they draw a few circle consecutively and they stop and see if they have formed some perfect circle or not. Once they form, they just go and outline that circle and erase the remaining out. So that's one way of drawing a circle that's not perfect circle. Bit here. Yeah. So that's one way of getting the circle correct. But I would not suggest you use compass as as I told this is for making head. Your, your goal is not to make circle. Your goal is to make a head. So if you draw a circle using a compass, you are actually, you know. Destroying the point because you're not making any changes on the head. You're making changes 
on the outside you don't need the circle actually these are just for a guide as i told the circle is going to be erased off the only thing that's going to stand off are the nose mouth eyes etc so yeah now let's move on to the technique of shading sorry now shading is a bit tricky especially for beginners who don't have previous experience in knowing light and shadows even i myself just recently learn the theory behind shading now you don't need to know the theory for shading to produce great drawings you can just copy and get the idea correct now, i had an idea of how to shade i had a rough idea on you know how to get that particular shade on the paper i had a rough idea of how light behaves i didn't know the entire principle until you know a few years back let's say so whatever drawing i did i had a reference piece and i copied values to values like i increased the darkness until i thought it matched with the drawing and i added sh shadows according to my feeling of how the light would behave so for a beginner this is a extremely new concept and i would really recommend you guys really follow along with me in this one so i will just give a brief intro on how light and shadows work so let's say we have a two dimensional object and a light source so the light falls uh, uh, that's not proper yeah this would be. so let's say the light is falling over this circle so if this is the point of origin of the light the light will form a cone the in there are a lot of light rays coming out of here from a single point but the light that is hitting the surface does not go further like it cannot illuminate these areas because you no know, it's a sphere you can't go beyond this point into this the light does not bend it always goes straight so the li the line that the light that is hitting here terminates over here same goes for the light that hits here we can ignore remaining of the light as it has nothing to do with the ball so if we draw a circle over here this thing formed is called a light cone as the light will only be in this areas and the remaining areas will be in the shadow so this area will be in the light and this area will be in the shadow so yeah so you get a clear distinction between light and shadow and ironically and logically this line is known as a terminator for those who want to make jokes so the terminator is basically area of plane or the line after which the light does not pass Wait, is it just yeah so the terminator is the point after which the light does not pass so it's completely in shadow so if i'm drawing shadows from here and drawing shadows is also easy you just have to extend this light and this light to the plane where you want the shadows to be let's say here draw a straight line and just curve it because light can fall from any way from here but can't go beyond this point so the shadow will start forming here and same goes for here the light from here can fall here the light from here can fall here but the light beyond this point the light does not bend so the entire area again becomes in the shadow now a thing about the surface is surface can also reflect light so if we use a completely dark surface on which the ball is standing on there will be no reflection because black absorbs the light if it's a white table the light that is coming over here can get reflected and get on the shadow surface and this does not mean it will be as bright as this area but it would be brighter than most of the areas in the shadow so putting all these concepts together almost forgot there is a concept called highlight also i'll bring highlight up later so first of all everybody like follow with me draw a circle now this doesn't have to be exact circle it's according to your wish 
and help you figure out how to make a three dimensional ball out of this you want to get this step correct as i told you the important step is getting the image into the page image page yeah so let's say the light is coming from here from the top and it forms a light cone from here and here so yeah that's a cone and the the point where the light touches the ball let's call this point this will be the lightest point in the entire drawing the lightest and there is highlight too but yeah the lightest point from that light would be on this point this area so let's get on so you get the rough cone like shape so this area will be completely dark the focus yeah so you shade the area and don't be afraid to go dark shadows are spots where there is no light and without light no object can be seen so it's you can go as dark as you want for this step i would prefer for those who have the entire pencil sketching kit the hp to 10b pencil i would suggest you guys take the darkest pencil that is in your hand and use the use the pencil softly for those who don't have just get the hp pencil and put on a little pressure but it will get the work done for those who have charcoal just follow along with me it works the same way so you want to spread the black around okay it's not dark enough I'll just go over a few more layers yeah so this is not the darkest value i have this is kind of the midway okay i'll just go over one more so the first step i did was differentiate the light from the shadow so this is the light side and this is the shadow side and in the shadow side also we will get a shadow so extending this line and this line and this two will get the almost consistent shading now don't worry if the boundaries aren't visible yet i'm not going to draw boundaries as such so yeah you get the shading done now the important step is to know where the darkest areas would be now this area can cast light over this area and the reflected light from this area would cast a light on this so the remaining areas would remain in dark so if i may i will go and increase the darkness i will go to the darkest values that is possible now for those who have the entire kit just put on the entire pressure for those who have hb do the same just increase the pressure and yeah the no matter how much light that provide that is provided from the ground the terminator area that's the this area would be the darkest no matter how much light the surface provides unless light is coming from the surface instead of from the top then the entire thing inverts so just go and increase pressure be really careful on the sides as there are reflected lights that are coming in and also the corners won't get much of the reflected lights it would generally be bounced off
so you get the bold to the darkness that you want. Again, the corners would be a bit more darker in the terminator also. So now this does not look anything like a bold currently. Yes, it does not. Yeah. I don't know what's the matter with this. Uh, yeah. See, it just I just spread a dark layer around. I did not do any changes over here. Neither the shadow. Now I need you to focus on this side. For those who have a kit, change the, from the darkest to the middlemost values or the HB. I prefer using the dark itself because I want the bold to be, you know, dark colored bold. That's my preference. But if you want to create an authentic looking bold, wooden bold or plastic bold, that lighter in color, you can switch to the lighter pencil that is in hand. Or like me, if you want to create a dark bold, just continue with the pencil in hand. So, yeah, another thing about shadows is they give a lot of information. So let's say let's take these two cases. If I'm shading one area until this point very darkly, like the maximum dark I can possibly get, and the other area lightly, the end, the terminal looks like it's sudden, like it's like a cube like it just ends suddenly whereas if i am gradually decreasing the darkness this looks a bit more like the controlled curve like that shown in the sphere so this area would be a bit darker than these areas this will be a gradient and again the light is falling on this area this will be the lightest going away from here would be a darker area so using the same principle i spread my graphite and charcoal around Now this is not the final what's going to come out, you have to blend it also a bit. Blending in the sense I'll show you. And just decrease the pressure that you're putting on until you reach the center. Now you just have to increase the pressure a bit to get the uniform smooth as compared to To get the uniform smooth as compared to the rough smooth, you know, the sharp turn instead of the smooth. It's a sphere, it's not a diffuse shape. Just have to increase the pressure a bit. So it started to take a bit 3D form, right? That's because we are manipulating, we are giving an illusion of depth. That's all what we are doing. That's the artist. We fool people by giving them an illusion. We can be considered as magicians to some extent. Trust me, first trials will be tough. Don't be disheartened if the fail just have to go in a circular fashion till you reach the center and just go on at the corners so you know get the dark areas done Wait. yeah so that's the sphere but the shadows is remaining that's smooth enough yeah, I'm really big And the shadows also follow the same principle of light. The point where 
the bowl is directly resting on will be really dark because no light no matter what it does it is unable to get to the shadow part so you add in the shadow so that those who know a bit of science knows the term umbra penumbra so yeah that's going to come up here so the area just under the bowl is going to be the darkest and then the light that is reflecting from here falls on the bowl and then on the shadow so going this way the darkness of the shadow gradually decreases and also one more thing happens so and one more thing that happens is that the a, the shadow that's formed under the sphere is really sharp the boundaries differ from the shadows but as we go to the side it actually starts to blend a bit out you can't make out clear margins of the shadow so yeah that's the you know about it get clumps here continue yes yeah. so that's the sphere that's getting the light reflected and it has everything right i'm blending properly most of them using a medium gravity i'm using a medium graphite so it has a bit of you know Uh, but it does the work. So yeah, that's the bowl having the light shined on it. Now another thing that comes up on a surface is known as the highlights. So what highlights are? So let's say there is a light source, and you are here. So when the light touches the surface and gets to your eye, it just won't get. Yeah. So the light that gets to your eye is known as a highlight. So one is called as well. So if the light source, light cone forms here. The the lightest point forms here. But if you are viewing from this side, the light that falls here would be the one that is coming to your eyes. So the center light and the highlight won't be necessarily be the same. They can be they can be same if the light. if you are viewing from head on if you are viewing from this side from the point where the light is falling is it that oh. yeah so if you are viewing from the from where the light is falling the highlight and the core light or the lightest part would be coinciding but as you move away the core light remains the same but the the, the lower you go the highlight changes position so if you are here the highlight would be a bit over here if you are standing here the highlight would be here but the core never changes so that's the difference between highlight and the core light so what you can do is you take an eraser and just specify a small area eraser just a small bit and this will be like the shine you have to you know clear it so for those who have use pencil eraser or tombow mono 0 for those who don't you can simply use the blade to cut the eraser the sharp tip and just use those perfectly fine both ways just have to get the area erased and you just have to you know kind of give a uh, not so prominent effect 
so in this entire drawing i did not draw an outline over this sphere i did not make the sphere stand out from the environment i just left the sphere shaded and just left it there so if i had gone over and made the sphere like stand out by drawing outline that's not how we see things in real life the background and the sphere just tend to stand out so that's a way to shade a shape using light and shadow and it gives a 3d effect too so yeah now do you remember the loomis method i had applied for drawing the face now you are going to use this loomis method and the shading method just what you oh, sorry for the noise yeah so i'm going to use the loomis method and the shading method that you just saw to get about a better skull impression than you know what you used to do earlier i hope now i'm going to rush a bit so it won't be as clean as i naturally generally draw but yeah so first you start with the circle and let's draw it 3 by 4 skull so I mean 3 by 4 view of the skull so i saw the image of the skull online and i had drawn it quite a few times you know so i got very familiarized with the skull i don't need a rough image for drawing it but you guys can either follow along with me or you can use a reference picture from net and just continue yeah so skull doesn't have any skin present no muscles present so it does not have the additional thickness that is provided by this circle so we just taper the bit off the skull is cut and now adding in a bit of the skull detail yeah. so the skull has this prominent bulge of the cheekbone this distance would be a bit roughly equal to this So yeah, that's the rough outline of the skull. Ah, it's looking a bit flat. I just do it again. I drew the circle a bit too thin, so you know, as I told you, might have to oh, see. This is what happens with graphite. A bit gets on your fingers and just ruins the page. So you have to be careful. So yeah. Sorry guys for the mistake I made. I could not correct it because I drew it a bit darker. it's the same process i'm repeating so no need to worry if you have already done step 2 and wonder why i cut it off yeah this should be fine
So yeah, we get the outline of the skull using the Loomis method. Now you have to add in the details. For adding details, just follow along with me. So the nose terminates about halfway. Like in the skull, you have a hole. You don't have a protruding nose, like without the cartilage, obviously. So you have a hole, gaping hole with the nasal bone. So, and the middle line. Just have to. So once the nose has been located, it's a war half one as you know. You get the detailed thing. Now from here you just now if the the light on that reference picture was falling from the side, so this area would be lit, and these areas will be in the shadows. But the point in the complex drawing is we don't have a surface that is smooth. There are ridges over here. There are surfaces that are you know. Going down like the eye socket and the nose socket, and there are shadows forming over here, etc. So you have to keep in mind of those things. So drawing the eye now. The eye of the skull is not like the human. It's a big socket sort of. So getting it right can be a bit tricky, but yeah, I think this ought to do. You have a big hole for an eye hole. Like there's a gaping hole. You can denote a small area that's protruding out. Yeah. So that's step one. Step two is drawing the other eye. Now most artists like me are afraid of drawing the second eye because you know it ruins the piece. I don't think it would happen in this case. Now, since the light is falling from this side, this eye would be much more visible. The internal part would be much more visible than this eye because it's on the shadow side. So, yeah. And again, the nose is not just a gaping hole. There are bit of things inside. The it can be seen. I leave the mouth as be like. For the time being, I'll just leave the mouth position right here. That's not how any mouth looks, but yeah, that out to do. Now for the shading purpose. Now this area is completely out of plane and in the dark, so this area would be in the complete shadow side. So it would be really dark over here. Now, and there is a bit of a ridge over here that separates the eyes. From the sideline, then comes the jawline. The same thing occurs over here too, and you know we are not going to. We can't draw it any other way. So this represents the jawline. And since the face is tilted to a side, this side prominates and gets darker. So a bit of the teeth and the jaws. Gets into the shadow side, so we now proceed to shading the shadows. So we just have to, you know, get the pencil to the side and just shade. Sorry, I'm shifting the paper. Again. Now you don't worry if you're not consistent; you will make some changes. You just have to. And. The nose, obviously, as I told, you, these are like cavities. The 
eyes, the, this side of the nose, the bones of the nose prevent light from entering from this side to this side. So, once you have done this, you have won pretty much half of the battle because you have you have drawn the skull, you have differentiated the light part from the shadow part and you have drawn a consistent shading of the dark that's it now you might want to increase the darkness of the borders a bit because it might get lost and you might end up searching for the same be careful not to smudge your drawing in the process Yeah. Now the thing about human body is that the eye sockets are really deep as comes when superficial light falls on it. So this thing would be dark and as it comes out, as we come out, this area would get lighter progressively. So it's not a sharp turn, it's more like gradient. So increase the decrease the force as you come out. So yeah, this gives the effect of cavity. Same goes with like yeah. Same goes over this eye. This will be more or less consistent value because you know the light is falling on that area of the eye. But yeah, this area will be slightly more darker than this and same goes for the nose this, this area. So this area would be darker progressively coming out. You see the shape is it's taking its shape. That's what we want. We want the image to take the shape. Now it's getting a bit of what we wanted it's still not complete but you know you get the dark areas darker light areas lighter and in this area of a human skull for those who have seen pictures of skull or have studied them before the jaw line actually has a lot of holes over here i'm just going to cover it up with black because it's easy and time i can save time A bit dark, and you know, this area is also, also supposed to be a bit darker. Make this point easy. Also, the head has a small ridge like shape that takes place. So yeah, that's it with the shadows part for now. We can improve or include more things later. So now to the light part, Wait, why is it looking bit yeah. Now for the skull, the skull has a small ridge like this. The skull is elevated, like if there's a bowl, the skull has a small elevation which will cast its own shadow on the down part from the light and it has an eyebrow ridge.
so this area will be more on the shadow side again the bold principle there will be one light part and the remaining parts will be a bit darker and as we go to the sides the darkness will increase and as compared to a bowl the skull is tapering off so it's not smooth transition it's like a sudden transition so you don't have to worry about that thing and of course uh, Ridge that we were talking about. For those again who know the bit of anatomy of the head, the skull, you know that the head, the skull is consisting of a lot of bones, so you just have to add a few more. This comes as a detailing part, which you can do or you can opt out. I generally tend to add these because they give a bit of authenticity to the skull. Again, shading to the bottom part as light is received now the nose will also cast a bit of shadow and i don't think i will be drawing teeth by now because you know time constraints teeth take a bit of time but if anybody is interested draw the line over here and taper it a bit and start putting in teeth okay i will draw the teeth Now, I'll put some of the teeth in the shadow region. some adjustment There is a bit of a notch called supraorbital notch, and there is a notch over here for arm and something. So, it's in a depression, so you have to shade it a bit to demonstrate it's a bit darker. Yeah, just have to place in the shadow. So light is falling on over here, so its shadow should be falling right.
Yeah, I think that should do it. Coming, I don't know why, but you know, coming in lines. But yeah. So that's how we draw a skull. Uh, I, Yukta Tyagaraj, on behalf of Pravega 2021, take this opportunity to to propose the uh, vote of thanks. I would like to thank uh, Nikhil Pradeep for having taken out time from his busy academic schedule to conduct this workshop. My gratitude to Professor Anil Kumar, Dean, IISC UG, for his constant encouragement and support and for providing us this platform to present the workshop. I thank the moderators and the entire team of Pravega, whether working on the forefront or on the backstage, for having made this endeavor a successful one. We hope the participants had a great time attending this interactive session. We look forward to seeing you all in the rest of the Pravega events. Do check out our Insta handles to get updates on upcoming talks, workshops and contests. Thanks once again.